Okay, welcome to our tutorial um, videos um, on case studies with MRG Solve PBPK and QSP model implementation and utilization in R. Uh, this was an afternoon tutorial session that, that we did as a collaboration between Metron Research Group, the University of Florida Cent Center for Pharmacometrics and Systems Pharmacology, as well as the ISOP Student Leadership Committee. Um, we did this at, at the University of Florida um, in the at the uh, end of March in the year 2018 and I just want to give you a quick overview of where you can find the materials and then we'll roll the content for the tutorial uh, that we did in the afternoon all the content is listed up on github so if we go to uh, the Metron Research Group github page and we search for maybe QSP We'll find this repository that's PVPK QSP MRG Solve. We'll click on that. There's a little README here that will introduce some of the case studies. Um, you can go down to the linking to the documents. Um, these are the vignettes that we work through in, in all the examples here. And you can see the code and all the output for the vignettes here. And then all the models that we use were previously published in the literature. Um, and so we have the references to um, to go back to those publications where we um, translated the models from, um, and then this will get you back to those original publications and also give um, the proper credit to the authors that did all the scientific work behind these models. So you can go to this repo, you can browse the content, look up the references. If you wanted to um, just get all the content in the in the repository you can either use git to clone this repository um, and if you don't know what git is or if you don't have git that's okay um, you can just click on this cloner cloner download button and then download zip and this will download a zip file to your computer that has all the content um, all the source code and all the um, the r markdown files that you need to to run the code um, if you're new to MRG Solve and need to install MRG Solve, um, there's uh, installation instructions on the MRG Solve uh, GitHub repo, and you can also ask questions there uh, if you're having uh, issues installing uh, MRG Solve. Um, you can ask questions there, and we'd be happy to help out. So we'll get into the content now. Thanks for watching, and uh, I hope you enjoy the tutorial session. There's a reading list, so all the 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 models that we're going to be um, dealing with today were have been published in the literature. Um, I think all of them except for one are um, open publication. Um, so you can just go, anyone can go down and download the, the publication. Um, and like the other thing I kind of noticed kind of ar ar arriving at the meeting is that um, I think all these publications of one except for one were published in a CPNT journal. And uh, for the, by far the most of them are published in the CPNT uh, PSP. So thanks to Pete and all the work, work they're, they're doing. I mean, we just, I mean, it's just a gold mine for people like us that want to get models and kind of start using them and if, for teaching and things like that. And so it's just really awesome to all the work that you guys are doing to make sure that stuff gets published and it's open and it's uh, shareable. So um, we're grateful for that. So um, these are our case studies. Um, before we get to the case study, and, and I think if uh, you, you'll probably want this piece if you haven't used MRG Solve before. So we're, when, we, when we use MRG Solve to simulate from these models, um, the process really isn't that different than using it in a PKPD model. Maybe the, the, the types of things that you do to get the simulation out might be slightly different, but I wanted to spend just a little bit of time like just basically showing you like how the workflow goes in R. And I'm just going to use like a regular um, uh, kind of PK model probably just to show just sh to show this workflow, it just works a little bit better when we're looking at the model and the workflow. And it'll give you an idea of like what's available and how you can plan out to do your simulations. Um, it'll also give me a chance to just um, write like a simple model. So we can't go into all the model specification in this time, but I'll code up just a very simple model for you just to see how that, that kind of works. And that'll get you started if you want to start running your own models. Um, so, uh, And I'm just going to do this in a, I'll just do this in an R markdown file. <coughs> this is demo 
Okay, this is my kind of, I think there's a document in there called Introduction to MRG Saw, but I never got around to actually uh, doing that. So, um, so you get, so you, you, can everyone see this, the screen up there? Is that uh, a good, oh, good, good text size? Um, so, um, so, um, so we, we, we load the MRG Self package with this library, MRG Self command. Um, a lot of the workflow depends, or we, we've linked it into this, some of the tidyverse um, uh, packages, so especially dplyr. So um, usually when I'm running this, I always um, install. I always start up dplyr as well. Um, I think technically you don't have to, but you probably will at some point. Um, and I'll put this whatever I come up with here. I'll put it up on the um, I'll put it up on the GitHub site so that you can get the, all this kind of code to kind of code around. Um, when you're learning MRG Solve, um, it's really nice to use. Um, so we've got an internal uh, library of models that are kind of pre-coded um, and that you can just access them to just start playing around with a model. Um, so it's anywhere from PK models to PKPD models. I think there's a TMDD model in there. Um, and I don't use these for production work, but I use them for a lot for demonstration. And if you want to just pick up a model and just kind of simulate around and just practice and things like that, they're kind of handy. And so like the, the first part of the workflow is just to create a, what I call a model object. Um, and we use that with the emery command. Um, and I'll show you where this kind of came from. So I'm going to do a, a one compartment PK model. Um, and the command goes like this. So I'm going to say the mod is gets assigned to um, the output from mread. And I'm going to ask for this model called PK1. Um, and I'm going to look in this, this. So this is, I did a function call. Oops, I got to run this first. Um, so I did a function call called modlib. If I spelled it right. So modlib returns the location on your computer where MRG Solve is installed, and all these demo demonstration models are sitting inside the package where it's installed. So you don't need to do anything else with these models, um, but I can just run this command, um, and it'll compile. If you can see it down at the bottom there, it'll compile the model, um, and it says done, and that means that the model file has been parsed. Um, it's been compiled into some C++ functions, and you've got this object now um, let me just reverse this here. Sorry. Put the console up there. Maybe that'll be a little bit easier to read, see. So now I've got this object that I can um, that I can simulate from, and uh, um, you can print this object out to the screen here, um, and it'll give you an idea of what's going on in this in this model. Um, so we've got, uh, uh, yeah, let me just get a pointer here, excuse me. I don't know if we can, does this show up on here? Probably not. So I'll just use the pointer. Okay, so I can just, so I can print that model object out to the console and I get some information about the model. Um, I've got certain compartments in the model, so this is as an extra vascular compartment and a central compartment. I've got some parameters, clearance volume and an absorption rate constant. Um, and then it's got some solver settings and things like that. Um, the other thing that this the model object has is it's got this internal time grid. And so when I simulate from this model object, I'm going to simulate from time 0 to time 24, and it's going to give me a simulated output every one hour. So that all that's kind of baked in here. Um, and I can uh, kind of dig down a little bit into this model object as well. So I can call a function called param. And that'll give me the model parameters. And so you'll see that not only are these kind of named, but there's a value in there. So whenever you create a model, it's got a, uh, it's got a set of parameters and it's got values associated with those parameters. Um, and so I can query that. Um, and I can also um, update that. So my parameters are updatable. So that I can say now instead of being one, clearance is gonna be 1.5. And uh, now that's been updated. So that's one way to update the parameters in a model. So you don't, you're not stuck with the, the values that are in there, um, but you are stuck with the names and the, and the number of parameters, right? So if you wanted to add a parameter, you'd have to go back into the model file, modify it, and then do this mread thing again to get the, that model, the model object back. So that's like this kind of concept of parameters. I mean, this is kind of a simple thing, and this is probably what the parameters are going to look like most likely for 
the PBK and, and, uh, and the QSP models, things like clearance, but you can also have things like um, covariates, like a weight or sex or EGFR, and you can have other things like flags, and it's just any kind of data that you want to have in the model that's controlling how the system advances, um, and they're updatable from this R side. So those are what we call parameters in the model. So there's also um, kind of the on the compartment side, so we, we've got two compartments in this model, that EV compartment and then a central compartment. Obviously, this is kind of a simple model, so there's not a lot here. We'll see what, on the bigger models, you, you see a lot more stuff come up. Um, but we call it init, and those are kind of like the initial conditions for that. Um, the, all the, both these compartments default to zero. Um, you can express, um, we could put like a non-zero value to initi initialize a compartment at some kind of static value, um, and that would come up here. Um, or we can um, do make an initial condition that's a function of other parameters in the model or other derived quantities. And when we call init on the model, it tells us the, the number of compartments, the names of the compartments, where they start out at. Um, and you'll see here, um, oops, I guess I can, I can show it on here. So you can see that this EV has got a one by it. And that means that's, that's, that's the first compartment in the model. So um, in general, in energy cell, we don't kind of care about the order of the model, uh, the compartments. And you can move compartments around without um, really any consequence on the simulation. Although we do follow a convention because we tend to use this with Models derived from NAMM a lot. Uh, we do keep track of the number because you can dose into a compartment by number. And that's just to really to maintain this compatibility with NAMM is with what NAMM is doing. So if you look at a model and you say, oh, I want to know what the um, where to put this dose for the, an extravascular dose, you might look at this and say that's compartment one there. Um, and then on the central compartment, it would be the second compartment. That would be compartment number two. Um. So that's why you can kind of dig into the model a little bit. Uh, you can also, uh, oops, sorry, back at the bottom of the screen here. I'll go here. There's a, a, a command called C. And so when you when you when you uh, call that C command, um, that model object has all the code that went into that when that was read to generate that model. So if I got if I've got a model object and I said oh, I can't remember what what was in here or how this was parameterized, um, I can just do call C and I can get the code and I can see, oh, there was these parameters, um, there's those compartments, and I can say this is a one compartment. This is how we write. Uh, Energy self has PK models that are uh, kind of one and two compartment with extravascular dosing, and they'll um, where the there's an analytical solution to the to the system, so you don't have to solve ODEs to get the solutions. So that obviously is a big uh, time saver if you're just doing PK type work. Um, but anyway, the, the point here is that you can just get to this uh, uh, get to this underlying uh, model code uh, th through that model object. So any questions so far about what we've done or kind of it all kind of makes sense? Um, yeah. Yeah, so um, here, let's, let's, I'll, I'll show you an example of this. So instead of doing PK1, I'm going to do IRM1. So that's an indirect response model. Um, and there's um, kind of a s series of those. Um, and I can see, I can take a look at this model here. Oops. I guess I'm over, I'm, I guess I'm over on this panel here. Uh, and you can see um, in this dollar main section, so I can say that, the, the, that there's a response compartment and it's a function of the input rate constant uh, divided by the output rate constant. And so whatever value those parameters are, when the system is initialized, that will be the initial value of the system. And I can use that, and we do this in the bone model all the time where we kind of express things in the model as a function of the, of the initial condition. So in this case, could you put um, the, uh, for instance, the one of the two functions, and then the Uh, we mean at the so at the initial condition. I don't think you really. 
Yeah, I mean, so like when the system's initialized, there's really no simulated output, right? It's got to be just something. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I can I can take it offline maybe later. We can you can kind of work out a, a specific example. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, it's, it's, so like it didn't update? Okay. Yeah. So it's um. So it's one there. And I do that update, and it got updated to 1.5 here. Oh, it's, oh yeah. So okay. So I see what you're saying. Yeah. So the so, um, so the question here is why uh, why does the value get updated here but not in there? Yeah. So the the when you do that C mod, so like the source code doesn't get updated. It's just the values in the in the object. The original source, yeah, and so we can make some changes to some of those values, but it's not going to go back and write that again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for all, for updating the model structure, can I just revise the CPC first? Yep. So it is well automatically go 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 into the file. Yeah. So like, if you want to update the model, you need to go back into the source code for this. So yeah, this yeah. was ran from the CPP file. You can make some changes, save the file. And then you kind of go back up to this part here. We have to read it and parse it and compile it again. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Um, so those are just a little bit of the ways that you can interact with the model. Um, when when you when you want to actually go uh, simulate from a model. And we can take we can capture this output and we call MRD sim mod and so I can just pass that into MRD sim and we just simulate it from this model I can look at this output and um, uh, what you get is is this, it's essentially like a data frame of simulated observations um, it's but it's got a special class to it so that it'll give it's got some extra information about what happened in there but you can just essentially think of it as a data frame and we can get this back as just a plain old regular data frame too um, but when we simulate, you always get um, uh, an ID number, you get the time of the simulation, you get every compartment, and then uh, every kind of derived variable um, that we had in the model. So we had compartments here of an EV1 uh, sent uh, peripheral and response. So that was our uh, indirect response model now. Um, and then, uh, oh, sorry, and then we had EV2. And then I uh, derived a, a CP compartment, which is the scaled uh, amount in the, in the, in the central compartment. So it's kind of like you, we, we've got that grid of times that we're going to simulate at, and then we get every compartment at every time. So it's kind of a, it's a wider uh, 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 format than you, you might be used to with non-men. Um, th that was kind of a boring. You can kind of see like nothing really happened here <laughs> um, um, be because we didn't really put an intervention in to the, we didn't perturb the system at all. And so we get kind of all zeros back and nothing really happened. Um, so we can uh, add an intervention. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just, this is going to be important for what we're going to see a, a lot here today. So um, MRG Solve kind of, we adopted this, there, there's a piping uh, mechanism that was kind of popularized by the deep layer package and the, this whole kind of tidyverse workflow. Um, and these pipes, we call it this uh, percent, uh, greater than percent sign. Um, and these are called pipes. And basically what I can do is I can take the model object is I can pipe it into MRG sim and these two lines are the same kind of the, the equivalent thing here, right? So I've got MRG sim and I've got mod as, as, as its first argument. Um, and this is the same, this is the same way. This is saying take this model object and pipe it into this function as the first argument. Um, and we can run this uh, and we get the same thing out. So that's, you'll see a lot of our simulations set up like this. Um, because we're going to set up our simulations, um, there's going to be several things that we can do to set up our simulations. Um, and so I can uh, take this one line down, and instead of piping this right to MRG sim, I'm going to pipe it to a function called EV, and then I'm going to pipe it along. Um, and so this, this says, the take this model object, pipe it to EV, 
um, do whatever you're going to do, and then pipe it to MRD Sim. So it says do one thing before you simulate. Um, and what we can do here is we can say amount equals 100, and we can run that. And now we've just put a, a, a 100 unit dose into that uh, first extravascular compartment at time zero. And when we simulate, now we get some kind of productive simulations. Um, this EV function, this is, this is an, an event object. And this is just like a quick way to put some dosing information into your model. So if I just run this EV line by itself, um, I need to get this back here. I'm going to bring this back. So I just ran this, uh, just this EV piece. Um, and this, this just says that this is an events object, and it, it just has um, things like the time the event's supposed to happen, what compartment it's supposed to go into. Um, we can do this compartment by name too, but I've just always done it by number. Um, and how much to put in, and it's got a concept of things like EVID that you might be familiar with from, from non-MEM. So EVID is um, just a, a bolus dose into that uh, dosing compartment. Um, there's other things like II, um, which is the interdose interval. So this, if time was in hours in this model, we can do a dosing every 24 hours. And we can do like a total of uh, six doses or seven doses. So ADDL or additional doses to do, and this is kind of adapted from the what what NAMM is doing, and we can run this um, and and run that, and that's our output. Um, and so I think a lot of our uh, uh, examples here with in the with in the, with the PPBK and the QSP, um, we're going to run these kind of event objects. These event objects can be generalized into a what we call a data set, and that's where we've got a population of people that have different dosing arrangements and, and things like that, or they might all have the same. Um, but you can kind of stack this up into a non m like input data set um, to simulate from a population. And we'll see one example of how to do that. Uh, but I just wanted to introduce this, these event objects. Um, when you're playing around with MRG Solve and just trying to, this is um, our, our kind of modeling workflow. Uh, we kind of recognize that it was really kind of important to get some feedback, like pretty quick and pretty easy for what happened in the simulation. And this isn't always the best thing to, to look at. Um, but I can take this output, I can, um, uh, I can pipe it to plot. Um, and so now I get uh, the simulation, it did the simulation. Um, so it took the, our, uh, let me back up here. So it took our model object, it attached this event, it simulated, and we can pipe this out to a, a plot method and uh, so that, that's one of the reasons why we have this, the output is this sort of special object because the object knows like what are the output variables for this. Um, uh, and so it knows what to make the plot uh, uh, or what to kind of facet on here so you can see all, everything that happened. Um, you might not be really interested in what happened in this second ex extravascular compartment. Um, and so I can, I can kind of make this a little bit more specific here um, is that I can, um, also request the plasma concentration and the response. Oops. Uh, oops, sorry. I did that in the wrong, wrong order. So I put the request below the, the simulation and I can't do that. So let's put that above the simulation. So when I take it, or, oops. So now I'm going to say all I want is the response and the and the and the CP compartment, and that's what you'll get. Um, there's also kind of some inputs that you can do to that plot method to say how you want the plot to happen. Um, I don't use these for um, publication or, or reports or anything like that. They're really simple plots, and it's really made to get you like a quick view of what happened. Um, you kind of see that um, this didn't really, maybe just didn't turn out the way you expected. Um, we did uh, 100 units every 24 hours, um, and we got, it looks like we only got one dose here, and maybe we want to make this look a little bit nicer for, for the simulation. Um, uh, so we had an output time here. Um, so remember, at right under model object, we had this time grid that ran from 0 to 24 by 1, and that's why we got this output here. 
and I can easily kind of run this out to to, to cover. Uh, oop, I don't want the plot there. Sorry. So I can go into this MRG sim function. And I can just say run the simulation out to a uh, 168 hours, and then I'll get all our doses there. Um, and then, um, like the other thing you can do is. Um, Say like I, I want a little nicer. I want a smoother line on my simulations, and so this time grid here was only getting us a, a, a simulated observation every one hour, and I can say uh, delta equals zero point one, and then that'll. It's kind of hard to tell on this on this with these multiple doses, but that got us a, a much kind of finer grid for our output. Um, uh, so I can modify that 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 grid of output times. Um, on the on the fly and it's kind of independent of the model and independent about how the the model was written or how the model was compiled Oh different doses in the plot Yep, sure um, so um, So yes, yeah, so the so if you didn't hear the question, um, there's a question about how do you add um, do a single simulation with multiple doses um, so these these event objects are, are they're kind of on by design like simple, um, um, but you can combine them in different ways, um, and it, so I think you want to do like like this whole profile once for 100 milligrams and once for 300 milligrams. Okay, um, so these are so these can be, so these event objects can have like different doses in them, but they're really meant to be for kind of one person or one unit, um, and when we get to populations, um, let me just copy this down because I'm gonna. Then we do it's something a different. It's similar, but it's it's we call it a data set. And um, um, this this data set can be um, it's just a data frame in R, um, and we've got a bunch of helper functions that just right. So we, we so we can we started off and it was really simple and we said okay we'll make this data frame. But we got sick and tired of like doing all that data assembly to make all this happen, and so we came up with these series of helper functions that it might be what you want, it might not be. Um, but we've kind of anything that gets tiresome to do. We've I think we've kind of gotten around to finding a quicker and kind of neater way around it. Um, but one really quick way to do a bunch of doses is there's a so there's an R function called expand grid, and that takes what you put into it and makes all combinations of those things. And so we made a function called expand EV. So this is like a it's kind of like your events thing, um, but I can say amount equals I can do like three different amounts here. And if I look at that, eh, sorry. Sorry. So this is just a plain old data frame, um, and it looks kind of like that event object that we had, but now we've got three different IDs and we've got three different doses. Um, and um, this is kind of a simple one, but this could have as many different people and just arbitrarily complex dosing, right? Um, it works like non-mem, so um, this ID one is kind of a separate unit than ID two, and but we could have other records in there that could just be very uh, irregular or however you want to set it up. If you can make it, you can pass it in. Um, and so this is sort of like a the simple version of like this generalized dosing, um, and you can pass this in with a function called data set. And I just say, okay, here's my data set. So I already did the work to do that, and I'm going to pass this in. <sighs> Something happened to my. Sorry. I'm just kidding, you want this here. Huh. Uh, it's showing up there, but I just don't know. Huh. 
Sorry, I'm gonna switch to just an R script here. Okay. So then you just you it'll kind of go through and it's gonna do all three of those that those dosing interventions kind of one at a time and it'll give you all three kind of people coming out. If you can make the if you can make this input data set, you can simulate from it. Um, so a lot of times we, you you know when you're doing like population stuff. So this is how this expand EV says. Um, if I had a population model with some kind of, kind of random effects in there and things like that, it's not going to work with this model. But just to illustrate, so I can do ten people. Um, so if I say right, so this is this is all um, combination. So this is going to do three doses in each of uh, with 10 people each so this makes a, a template that looks like this so now I've got three doses and I've got 10 people for each dose and we feed that into a population simulation that's gonna um, kind of simulate uh, all combinations of those and so it's gonna be 10 people at each dose level um, it's just not gonna come out in this in this plot because there's no random uh, there's no random effects in the model so it's gonna look like there's only three people there but that's kind of if you can make that thing, you can um, add like covariates on there. You can, um, it could be like a clinical data set. So we, when we're just simulating kind of from nothing, like we want to, we tend to make the data sets like this. We're just kind of, we want to make up 10 people at, at three different dose levels or whatever it is. Um, but it'll also take your clinical data set that has irregular dosing at irregular times and things like that. Um, and there's a there's a, a vignette that uh, up on the website that I can I can pull up that'll show you like different ways to make these um, kind of more easy than not hopefully. Yeah. Is there also a way to change the time point when you want to simulate? Like to not have only like a one hour difference, but in the beginning a shorter and then at the end like a longer difference. Yep. Sure. Um, so. Um, so the question was, is, is there a way to get some more customization for the time points? Um, and kind of the, the basic way that we do it is through this kind of like grid. And we'll say, well, what if you don't want this, this, this strict grid of time points? So there's two things that you can do. Um, so in addition to end and um, this delta to make this sequence, there's, a, there's something called add, where I can just put in this ad hoc vector of times. And if I can come up with these times, it'll just kind of put that into the mix. Um, and so if there's like a specific time that you want that isn't in the time grid, you can do that. Um, I'll just do a really quick demonstration of this because it might be more what you're talking about. Um, you might have something called, um, like your peak is going to be um, from a, um, so there's a function called T grid and that's a time grid. And that's going to go from zero to six and we want kind of intensive sampling there and then this there's like a sparse might be like this zero to 48 by like six so this is the same so this is the kind of doing the same thing that's in the model it's it's start time end time and then this delta so we're going to get intensive samples around the peak then we're going to get these sparse samples out to two to two to do to two days um, and we can kind of combine these and we can just say uh, my design is the it's the peak plus the sparse and so you can kind of put those together and then um, and that's just some kind of grid of times and it's just a way to kind of put them together so you can kind of mix and match these a little bit um, and you might do this um, de the design on day one is like that and then the design on day five is does day one plus 24 times. Right, so you can kind of do operations on these to say, I want this exact same design, but out, out on day five. And then you can kind of put them together like that. So there's these kind of objects that try and help make that a little more convenient. And then, uh, oh, I should say too that um, if you want to use that setup, um, then um, 
well, I'll just do day one. So that'll just give us that first day, that first time point. So it's you pass it in, um, you say here's the this T grid or this time grid that I put up, um, and so it gets you out of having to like write stuff in there. You can kind of program this and just have these objects just sitting around and say I want this one, not that one. Um, good question. Yeah. Okay. True. Um, <clears throat> I think we'll see a little bit about that, but let's just, I'll just talk about it now because we're in, this is kind of simple. Um, so, um, so there's a couple ways you can do it. Um, so you basically want to do this. I'll do a hundred milligrams on day one and then, uh, like 50 milligrams on day two or it's just something like that, right? So I can either do time equals um, 48. And then I can, my event is E1 and then do E2. So we can run that. And so now we've got um, one dose at the start and then, or sorry, it's not 48, sorry. You wanted this. Well, either way, you can kind of see what, what you do. You can combine these in, in ways. Um, that's not too hard to do when you're doing like day one, day two. Um, so we kind of have this other way where I can say, um, so I can put this in a sequence. Um, so I can say this E1 and then wait, uh, uh, wait 24 hours and then do E2. And that'll give you the, the oh, sorry. So you got you get, so now you got two doses um, that are in the mix, and I want to combine them in just different ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I want to do e e one, and I've got this e two, and so I'm going to say put these in a sequence. So first do e one, then wait 24 hours, and then do e two. So that just gets us basically like the same thing. Oops, I just want to make sure I ran this. So that kind of gets us the same thing that we did before, but it gets us out of having to do that calculation. Um, and it's nice because you can do stuff like um, uh, it was 24 ADDL is is a uh, 999, and so I can just put this at an, at an, at the end of the sequence, and it'll say do this for 16 weeks, and then do that for eight weeks, and it'll kind of do the calculations to figure out when one kind of sequence ends and the other one starts, and so that's called a sequence or a, a and there's a bunch of little kind of helpers in there to kind of help you put these together. We'll see one of these in the in the ERC inhibition model, um, where we we we've got like especially when you're doing like oncology type stuff, and the, well, there's one example where it's like three weeks on and then a week off and then th another three weeks on and then a week off, and um, you can you can code that yourself. It's not it's not impossible to code it, but we got again it's one of those things we got tired of doing, and so we kind of came up with a way to kind of combine these in a flexible way. Okay. Um, just like a, a couple other, just I don't know. People usually want to know about this, um, so we we uh. So when I do the so when I do this uh, simulation, I can capture this to, to an output. Um, and this is just like this. This is this kind of a um, oops. Oh, sorry. So this is just this this object, and the kind of the nice thing about this object is that I can like do things like plot, and it just makes a plot of what I did, and it makes it easy to deal with, and I can um, I can, but I can also like pull off a column, so I can it, it kind of works like a data frame because there's really just it's really just a data frame under there, um, and so I can pull off the CP column there, and I can just with that dollar sign notation, so I just did this, so out dollar, and then the column name you can get that column name. Um, like, uh, but I think like um, when you want to go make plots for your report or you want to summarize these things, um, I can just say my sims are as data frame out. And now this is just a regular data frame. It's just like just a, a just a data frame. You can do whatever you want with it. So it's not like you're stuck it with this kind of specialized object. 
Um, uh, yeah, so um, trying to think what else we can talk about. Yeah. Yeah, so if you want to simultaneously administer into two or three compartments. So um, you would just I would just do um, my event is uh, so let's for first let's just look at what we got here for the for this example. So I'm gonna look into my model. Um, so um, so I did the init command on this model, and I've got uh, a central compartment, I've got two extravascular compartments, um, and then I've got a peripheral compartment. So let's do, um, so one thing we haven't done yet is an infusion rate. So let's do like a bolus into the central compartment, and then um, like, we do a lot of infusion rates into extravascular compartments too. So we can try it and just see what happens. So, um, so what will we do here? So we wanna do 100 milligram bolus into compartment two. Um, because two is our central compartment, so that's going to be like kind of like our IV bolus. And then we've got, we'll start this oral dosing that's some kind of weird absorption profile. That's okay. Rate equals uh, two, you know, that's too long, 10. And the compartment equals one. And so I can just write these as kind of distinct events. And because they both, Right, so I, the time kind of defaults to zero, and so when I when I do this, now I've got at time zero we've got these two things happening, um, and we can just simulate this. Oops. Uh, what do I want to do? EV one plus. CP, or I'll do send. So now we get this weird looking thing. We got this infusion into this extravascular compartment um, after this bolus that we got from the, uh, that IV bolus. Um, so when you do make these event objects like this, you can make them, they're these standalone objects that you can pull like this one, not that one. And then you can just pass them into this EV function just the same way you did when you were typing the dosing in there. Now, obviously, the more complicated the work and the project, you want to you want to have these kind of hanging out in your environment, so I can um, uh, kind of use which, whichever ones I want. Um, and then the other thing on this is that when we do plot, we can do a, a formula here to say what we want the plot to look like. If there's a lot of compartments, you can just say, "I'm just interested in these two, and then you can get the plot to do that. Yep. Very naive question. Okay. Uh, MRG source does not fit models. It's just a simulation tool. Yeah, MRG self doesn't fit models, but I'm going to show you how to fit a model in one of the examples today if we can get to it. Okay. So, um, did you have another one? Did you have another question? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so, what is the difference between the request command and uh, when you plot the compartments that you want to show um, in a line? Uh, my understanding is that a request is only simulating those compartments, the plot simulating everything, but only plotting those. Yeah, that pretty much. I mean, you simulate every compartment every time. Um, when you only request the CP, like the, the we only request certain compartments, basically before it does the simulate, before Emergy Solve does the simulation, it says, okay, I've got these many outputs, I've got these many output times, and it allocates this big matrix, and it can get big. It can be millions of rows or more. Um, and so when you only request those two, um, it, it, it just allocates a smaller matrix. So it might have a, uh, some impact on like the memory. It's not that hard to si out simulate your, the memory on your computer. Um, and so it just, that's just a way to get less stuff back. We're gonna do all this stuff in the vignettes too. Um, so, um, uh, so maybe like I think maybe a little bit of time up front here, just kind of talking through this, and we can in the vignettes we'll be doing this with the PBDK models and things like that, and we can kind of talk a little. We can kind of maybe focus more on the what's going on in the model and things. But I thought it'd be worthwhile just to play around here and just kind of show you basically 
how this kind of works. Um, we we kind of designed this just to make it so that you could just write just as little code as we could think of. Um, and um, so because we wanted to make it easy to fire off a simulation and really make this kind of interactive and, and uh, 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 just, yeah. Yeah, so um, how can you put variability on the parameters? Um, so there's there's a couple ways. Um, so, well, yeah, that's a great question. That, that was actually one of the main points I wanted, I wanted to talk about. Um, so do you? But so I so I'm kind of thinking you want to do you want to see like the uh, like the random variability piece? Yeah, okay. So you can toy around with. There's a model. There's a model called POP EX, and that's my kind of population ex PK example model. Um, it's not too, too terribly complicated, um, but if we look here um, in my model, so we've got kind of following non-mem conventions, we've got things like omega and sigma, um, where I can put in an omega matrix, and I can put some variances here. Um, I can, uh, now I've got these symbols called eta CL, eta V, and eta KA, and I can just add those onto the parameters here. Um, so I can add this uh, eta CL onto the eta, and then this the profile is gonna have some variability in it. So one way is through eta. Um, the other way is I've got a covariate model here, right, so that the clearance is a function of weight. And so, um, I've got weight in the in the model, and so I can generate some variability through the covariate as well. Um, so just a, a, an example on this one, I'm going to do this. Um, So I'm going to do my little, make my little data set here, um, and I'm just going to do a bunch of different weights here. Um, so we had a uh, weight from 40 to 140 by uh, 20 kilos. Um, and I can, um, so let's do a simulation with this POP EX model. Uh, so I'm going to pass it in as a data set, right? Took a little bit more time to create, but I got a lot more flexibility when I do it like this. Um, so I'm going to simulate and then I'll plot. And I just need to back this off a little bit. Well, you can kind of see that. So and I've got, um, and so what I did here is I, um, so we've got the this gut compartment where the doses are going, the central. I kind of like captured the clearance and the and the volume, and so you can see that we've got different clearances and volumes here. Um, and then um, there's like a pred and a dv, and anyway, um, so you can kind of see the variability in that plot. Let me just back this up a little bit. So this is CP. Oops. Oh, I'm gonna do CP of the dv. Okay, um, let's just make it a little bit better. Let's do it by 10. Five. Yeah, so, okay, so like, so there's like a couple different levels of variability in here. There's the variability due to the weight, and then that random variability due to the random effects in there. Um, if I if I just said I want to just look to see what the effect of weight is, so I so I, I've got this kind of population model with this random variability. I can just say like just drop the random effect business, and I can just say don't simulate the random effects, and I can do that from the R side. So I don't need to go in and like delete the etas out of my model or anything like that. But this function will just take the uh, to turn all those variances to zero, and now you get this kind of sensitivity analysis on weight. So you take out that random component, and you've got. This is how weight is changing the, in the in the PK there. So we try to make it so that like we give you as much flexibility like at runtime 
as we could. There's some things that we couldn't let you, it's compiled into the model, we just can't change it, but we try to give it so you can take the same model and use it for these fixed simulations or the random variability and, and like you decide, like we decided what we wanted the weights to be and we that's all kind of outside of the model. We can do it with, with weight or without weight or with random or without random and that kind of stuff. So um, maybe we'll take a break before we, oh yeah, got another question, yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the units. So MRG solve doesn't really have any uh, concept of. Uh, it doesn't keep track of the units. So it's kind of like nonmem that way. And so like whatever units your doses are in, or like uh, um, I guess it's your like your and it's I guess it really comes down to your uh, parameters, right? So if you make your clearance in terms of liters per hour like your model is in liters and hours and uh that's kind of what determines that and like it's not too hard to kind of mix up the units to get it out of whack and so it's kind of up to you to make sure that your doses are consistent with the um the units of your uh the the parameters so that the outputs are in the units that you want There's no units yet. I mean, they're, yeah. Right, yep, yep. I mean, there are, there are units, but it's just not explicitly accounted for because there's nothing really we could do. I mean, I've thought about like trying to like take control of that or like say, okay, if you specify the units of your parameters and we'll check that your doses are, but it's pretty complicated and it's probably error prone. And so we just kind of leave it up to the you, you to kind of code it properly. Um, so you can simulate, um, um, I, I, I think we, it's, it's kind of beyond the scope of what we're, what we're going to do today, but let's just say you had, uh, some kind of logistic model and, uh, driven by some PK or something like that, right? Driven by some continuous PK maybe. So you could simulate the continuous PK, right? And then it's just calculating the value of that logistic function and generating a yes, no, or whatever the categorical variable. You can simulate that in MRG Solve. Um, there's a, uh, you have to compile in something else, but you can simulate any type of data that you would in R, you can do it inside your model. Um, but it's sort of like intended, so you, you can do that and we do do that, um, but like if you're just simulating categorical data, like I don't think there's any, I wouldn't use MRG Solve. I would, you could do it faster and kind of more flexibly. Yeah, you could do that, or you could just say like, I'm going to simulate some random variable that's like uh, comes from a binomial distribution or something like that. That's based on the continuous data. You might do something like that. Um, yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So the question was, can he select the ODE solver? Um, yeah, I should have said that in the in the beginning. So there's just one ODE solver that's available in here. It comes out of ODE pack. Um, and it's a general purpose solver. It's the same solver when you're in non-mem and you use advent 13. And so it's a solver that automatically switches between stiff and non-stiff okay. differential equations. Um, it's been on our kind of, we've been thinking about like, right, we can, so there's, a, you might know about the Sundials solver uh, suite that we've been thinking about integrating that in. Um, but we just, so far we just haven't had a, we haven't come across a model where we said, oh, I would just, if only we had a different solver, we could do this. I'm sure that points somewhere, but um, that might be on the horizon for, for later. But so far, it's just the general purpose one seems like it works pretty good. <laughs>